Uh, okay, we are continuing in our um, Epic Jesus Encounters uh, sermon series. Actually, today's the last uh, Sunday. Uh, and we've been looking at encounters Jesus had with people throughout his ministry. Uh, as I said, this morning's our last encounter right before Jesus leaves uh, to be with the Father. And this last encounter is with his disciples, and it's in Acts uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. It's going to be projected. Uh, you can use the Bibles in the pews, Bibles you brought with you, uh, Bible app, or I believe it's on um, one of the sides of the sermon notes, if you want to take, uh, if you want to take that out from the bulletin and you can follow along. So here we go. In my former book, so this is, uh, most people believe Luke wrote Acts. Uh, so that's the, in my former book, but Luke also wrote Luke. So that's what he's talking about here. And he's writing to this same guy, Theophilus. They must have been very close and good friends. And he must really be concerned and, and caring that Theophilus understands who Jesus is and what he's accomplished. My former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Now, those instructions, it could mean a number of things. At the men's uh, lunch on Thursday, uh, one of the guys says he thought that maybe these instructions that Jesus gives uh, kind of is a review of what's going to happen in the book of Acts, which I, I had never thought of before, and it was a very interesting theory, and I think there's, there's some truth to it, for sure. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command— do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father, wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father is set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you as we enter into your word. May your word enter into us and transform us. Give us ears and hearts, minds to understand what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I get into my message today, I, I, I want to say that uh, some of you, some of you will notice that my sermon today is slightly longer than Sean's sermon was last Sunday. Last Sunday, uh, a number of folks came up to me in a very, in a very loving, uh, yet somewhat joking manner. You've all experienced this kind of loving but somewhat joking manner, asked me if I might consider keeping my sermons the same length as Sean Farrell's sermons. <laughs> because I listen and take seriously the comments I receive from you all, I fervently prayed and considered the suggestion. While I was in deep prayer, a clear voice of God came to me in a vision and said, no. <laughs> so hang on and enjoy the ride. 
With that in mind, did you hear about the duck who was waiting to cross the road when all of a sudden a chicken came running up and shouted at the duck, don't cross that road, you'll never hear the end of it. I like these guys, they laughed. Every one of them laughed at that <laughs> joke. Yeah, I like it. You know, that is exactly what is happening in the book of Acts. By the time we get to the end of this passage this morning, the world will never hear the end of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished. However, something must happen first, or more accurately, not happen. You know, the book of Acts is all about what it, its name states, right? Action. It's not the book of thoughts or writings or beliefs or sayings of the apostles. It's the book of the Acts of the apostles. Or you could say the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. It starts with the action of Jesus leaving, followed by the action of his giving and then the action of the disciples going, leaving, giving, and going. But the first action is waiting. You know, it's an interesting exercise to think how much waiting we do in our lives, isn't it? Everything from what we might call everyday waiting, you know, waiting for your coffee to brew, waiting in a stoplight, waiting in a cash register, etc., but then there are what one might call waiting for a major event or experience. Waiting for your bride to walk down the aisle. Waiting for your vacation that you've been planning for months to start. Or waiting for test results concerning a cancer screening. They all involve waiting, but the way in which we wait is far different. And the disciples are waiting. They've seen the risen Jesus several times now, Luke tells us, and they are ready to go. The waiting has ended. They're ready to move into action. They're ready to take Rome on, take the world on. Come on, risen Jesus, let's go. But Jesus says, not so fast. Your first action will be, in a sense, a non-action. So let's start with the waiting, or what I'm calling the don'ts in our passage. I see three of them, and then three do's. So we're going to start with the three don'ts. Here they are. Don't leave Jerusalem. Don't expect a political kingdom. And don't spend your time looking up. First, don't leave Jerusalem. Why not leave Jerusalem? Now, one could say, well, the reason why Jesus doesn't want the disciples to leave Jerusalem is because that's where the Holy Spirit is going to come, in Jerusalem. Okay, but does that mean that we're saying the Holy Spirit is somehow bound to a certain location? The Holy Spirit is somehow geographically limited, like he doesn't have enough frequent flyer miles to travel around? I don't think so. And, and, and that certainly can't be the case, because in the rest of this letter, and in fact the rest of the New Testament, the Holy Spirit shows up in all sorts of locations, to all sorts of people, in all sorts of circumstances. I would propose two ideas. Think about when you have started off on a new adventure, a new experience, or a new project. This is kind of a very practical idea that Jesus is giving the disciples. You know, having others with you on that adventure, journey, and experience usually gives you a bit more comfort, confidence, and encouragement. In about four weeks, a total of 30 folks, some from here and some from Valley Presbyterian Phoenix, we're going to be leaving for the Yucatan. And we are going to, including all of you, we, even though you may not be going, because I know that you're going to stop by the build a roof table and buy some materials for us, because that's a shameless plug that you should do. So thank you for that in advance. We're going to build 
a concrete roof, a floor, and a sport court for a Presbyterian church in a town called Tizimin. But before that trip happens, we are all going to meet as a team and go over some important details of the trip. And I know from experience, almost everyone is a bit nervous, even if they won't admit it. And they're nervous about all sorts of things. Flying, being away from home, sleeping in a hammock, lifting heavy objects, getting along with each other, etc. But I remind them that we are in this together. We will experience this adventure together. So stick together, work together, suffer together, (laughs) rejoice together. Second, Jesus' continued mission of spreading the gospel and building his church starts with the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. And this is not, I repeat, not a statement about who is more important. It is rather a statement about timing. Timing. Jesus wants the initial launch of this new movement, new community, what we call the church today, to start at the center of Jewish life. This is exactly the point of the REACH principle, if you think about it, or one of the the points. Each of us, each of us are to do what? List, pray for, invest in, and then invite who? Those 8 to 15 folks on our front row. Those who live in our Jerusalem. Now, it's not only Jerusalem, but that's a good starting point. What are the disciples? And, and so, so I think that's why Jesus wants them to stay there. Second, don't focus on the wrong issue. What are the disciples focused on? Political kingdom building. It says it right there in the passage. When are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? The disciples still don't quite understand the kind of kingdom Jesus has brought and will continue to form even after he is gone. You know, when the Holy Spirit finally comes upon the disciples and the others, he not only opens their eyes to understand and comprehend who Jesus is and what he has accomplished, the Holy Spirit also reorients their understanding of Jesus' kingdom purpose. Now, we need to remember, everything the disciples had been taught and understood from the Old Testament, since they were little children, has led them to believe and have hope in a Messiah that would bring freedom from political oppression. And when you've been an oppressed people for as long as Israel has, who doesn't want political liberation? Now note, Jesus' response to them is not saying a transformed life and community will not have political and cultural implications. He's saying that the Holy Spirit transforms communities by first transforming individual lives. We are transforming agents. And the way we transform our communities, the people in our community, the way we do that and the way we, or why we can do that, is because we have been transformed. That's how the gospel works. That's how it's always worked. Individual people whose lives have been transformed by the Holy Spirit are used as agents to transform other lives, and then those lives transform communities. We're little community transformers, each of us individually. The one that changes lives is not on the seat of power in government legislatures but rather on the seat of God's throne. Let me say that again. The one that changes lives is not sitting in the power of government legislatures, but rather is sitting on the seat of God's throne. And we need to remember that and remind ourselves of that over and over again. 
You know, we can get so caught up and bent out of shape by what is happening or not happening in our world. You know, it's no wonder a movie called Everything Everywhere All at Once won the Oscar for Best Picture this year. Because that describes exactly how many of us feel and process life around us, right? It's just like everything and everywhere is happening all at once. <laughs> but friends, hear Paul's words to the church at Ephesus. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so what? That. So that. So what? You can just contemplate it? You can go, oh, that is such a nice saying. Oh, Jesus is so, that's just a great guy. No. So that you may know him better. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he what? Raised raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly, in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. We worship. We are transformed by a risen Lord who is now king and ruler of the universe. You know, friends, none of us know what the rest of this day, this week, this month, or year will bring about. But we do know this. Jesus is king. Amen? Amen. Jesus oversees it all and has overcome it all. What is that wonderful saying? I love this saying. I don't know what the future holds, but I do know who holds the future. It is because we know who holds the future that we work to make this world a better place for all as the Spirit guides and empowers us. Third, don't spend time looking up. Obviously, Jesus' ascending was quite the sight, right? You know, it's not every day you see a person rising like a rocket into the sky. We're not sure exactly what this looked like. No cameras around to snap a picture for us. But there have, been, there have been many, many paintings that have tried to capture the scene. I think Chris got three of them for us to look at. Here's one of them. Kind of centers on the disciples. <laughs> we see Jesus' feet. Because the rest of them is kind of caught in the cloud. They keep looking up. The next one, um, we've got, uh, you're not sure, not quite as many disciples here. Lots of angels, though, accepting Jesus, right? And then the third one, is sort of a panoramic view. I love this one. Um, and they're the disciples, and there's the two guys in, in white. Uh, you know, I read somewhere that uh, except for paintings uh, about the cross, uh, the ascension is the event that is painted most uh, in Jesus' life. Which is a kind of ironic because you don't hear many uh, sermons about the Ascension. <laughs> uh, you're hearing one today, a little bit later on, but you don't, you don't hear many. And yet, artists, those people that use their imagination and, and try to imagine things that, that, uh, that maybe we couldn't see, they, they love the Ascension. They, there are like paintings upon paintings about the Ascension. And that's what great artists do, right? They, they, take, uh, they take reality and they, and they try to give it, um, uh, you know, uh, help us see it. They, they give a twist to it. They, they help our imaginations see something that maybe we can't imagine. So I love these, I love these paintings. So how many of you have ever played tag? How many of you ever played tag? Come on, every one of you have played tag at least once in your life. Um, I think that's what's happening here. Uh, these two guys in white, two men in white, not men in black, men in white, show up and they say to the disciples, tag, you're it. Tag, you're it. 
Jesus is gone. He had told you on numerous occasions this was going to happen, so tag. Time for you to continue what he started. Next, three do's. Stay and wait. Wait and receive. Receive and be. Stay and wait. Wait and receive. Receive and be. Stay and wait. This is the positive side of don't leave. I don't need to say anything more. Uh, I think that I previously said, except to say they are to stay for a reason. There is something worth waiting for. So the next is wait and receive. Verse 4 and verse 8. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait to receive the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. And then verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you couple points. One, the disciples are going to receive a gift. The Father, along with the Son, has placed an order to be delivered to the disciples and all those who would very soon be gathered in that upper room. You discover that as you read on in Acts, right? And and most scholars believe that there's like a 10, maybe a 10, give or take a day here or there, that it's after Jesus' ascension which the giving of the Spirit occurs in that room. Why 10 days? Well, I'm thinking Amazon wasn't around, so there's no same day or next day delivery. Okay, that was, that was an even worse reaction than the 8 o'clock. <laughs> I mean, oh my gosh, it, it went, it was terrible. It was, it, you'll laugh later on at it. I know you, I know you will. <laughs> Ten days. Second, it's a gift, which will be given them power. Now, the word in the original uh, language is dynamis. For the word power here, it's dynamis. So, what English word do you think we get from the word dynamis? Dynamite. That's right. Uh, Somebody pointed out, uh, and I I couldn't remember. Now I can't remember his name. It's Jimmy something. Remember that show... It's quite a while ago. I don't know how long ago it was, but it was a show, and, and he would, his classic line was, Dynamite! Do you remember that? Any of you remember that? This is going over like my Amazon thing. It's nothing. It's dead here. It's, I need to move on. Dynamite! <laughs> I didn't even say it right. Sorry. And so the point is this power is not some small firecracker. This power is going to cause a blast, an an eruption, an explosion of supernatural power. If you remember the scripture I shared from you, Ephesians 1, is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The same power. Do you, we, understand what kind of power we've been given? Do we understand that this power is able to transform people's lives so that they will be raised from spiritual death to spiritual life, just like we have been? So are we keeping that power all to ourselves, or are we using it to change people, to change our communities, to change our world? And I know many of you have and are. Praise God, because we can, because we have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Finally, receive and be. Be what? Verse 8 again. Be my witnesses. Where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In other words, everywhere. Friends, you don't have to go everywhere. You simply have to be somewhere. And all of us are somewhere when we are where we are when we are there. Man, I got a better laugh than my Amazon one. Did you all understand what I just said? Because if you did, your mind is exactly where it should be. See, see I did that. Now, now I'm going to assume here that all of us know and or have experienced what it means to be a witness. We have, even if we don't think about it in this way, 
all of us have been a witness, okay? Because the word can mean several things. Uh, and it's interesting that the word used here also has a variety of meanings. It can be understood in the context of a courtroom, and that's how we usually think of it, right? In a legal sense. But it can also be understood in a historical sense. One who is a spectator of an event. It can also be understood in an ethical sense. That is, followers of Christ, Christians, are witnesses to Christ by how they live, how they behave. However, it can also be understood in the sense of being a martyr. And the disciples would have picked up on this immediately. Jesus is saying to these disciples, and every disciple which will come after them, that being a witness can and will have various degrees of what it means to carry one's cross. You know, as an aside, I am so thankful for the religious freedoms I enjoy as being a citizen of this country. However, I do at times wonder if within those freedoms I have missed opportunities for growth which those Christians without those freedoms have experienced. Just a thought. It certainly does not take much imagination to think that these disciples recounted Jesus' words to them as all of them were persecuted and finally martyred as witnesses for Jesus. I want us to end our time today giving some thought to the Ascension, and I will be brief. The Ascension is probably the action or event that is least talked about concerning the life of Jesus, and yet it is, is essential to Jesus' finished work as the cross and the resurrection. Let me say that again. The ascension is as essential to Christ's finished work as the cross and his resurrection. Without the ascension, there is no Jesus as ruler and king. No Jesus as judge. No Jesus who returns to gather his church. No Jesus who prepares a place for you and me in heaven. I bet you most of you know that verse. Without the ascension, there is no giving of the Holy Spirit. Jesus must go up before the Spirit can come down. Jesus must leave before the Spirit can arrive. And without the Holy Spirit, we are not only not transformed, but we are powerless to be a transforming agent for anyone else. Without Jesus' ascension, there is no Northminster Presbyterian Church because there is no church, period. Without Jesus going up, there is no us going out. The same question the two men in white asked the disciples is asked of us. Why are you looking up? Why are you looking up? It's about distraction, isn't it? They're distracted. And oh my gosh, we are so distracted, aren't we? I mean, we're all just like, you know, squirrel, 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 right? I, there's just so much stuff coming at us. And we look around the world, we're on the, and we're just so distracted. So how can we be witnesses when we're so distracted? You know, the way that we are witnesses of the gospel is is not simply when we tell somebody about Jesus or about our faith. You're a witness for Jesus in the type of grandparents you are, in the type of brother or sister you are, in the type of husband or wife you are, in the type of employer or employee you are, son or daughter, in the type of neighbor you are. 
That's how you're a witness to Jesus Christ. Oh, we sh- you know, if we just contain being a witness for Jesus on only those times when we talk about faith, oh my God, we have missed the point. We have missed the, com- the point of being witnesses. And that's what Jesus calls us to do. Why are you looking? Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to do this. Have you ever tried to walk any kind of distance and just look up? Have you ever tried that? Help me. Help me here. Right? I mean, you are not getting far without something terrible happening. Why are you looking up? you got to be looking out. And I think that's what, that's what the angels, that, that's, that's what these two guys want to get across to the disciples and get across to us. Quit looking up. Keep, quit being distracted by all that stuff that's coming in. And be my witnesses. How we treat others who disagree with us. How we raise our children, how we use our gifts, talents, and time. How we use our resources, how we share our faith, how we pray, how we do everything. That's what it means to be a witness. But church, unlike the disciples, the waiting is over for us, isn't it? The waiting is over. The gift that has been given, the power of the Spirit has been given, and so be So be, in everything you do, witnesses for for God's transforming spiritual kingdom in our world. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for going up and sending us out to be your witnesses and to bring transforming change in people's lives and in our communities. In Jesus' name, amen.